So we're going to talk about um, congenital anomalies, and I thought it, since in the last year or two, some interesting information has come out about cardiac where the coronary arteries come from, uh, that it might be interesting to spend five minutes looking at that. And we know that um, during early looping, uh, that there's a uh, group of cells called the proepicardial organ, which uh, is at the venous inflow. Here's the pericardial cavity here, uh, and here's uh, down here at the venous inflow into the heart, there's this little group of cells on the transverse uh, membrane down here. Uh, and these uh, break off, they're like little grapes or like little cauliflowers. Uh, and a lot of these sort of break off, they either go by direct contiguous uh, travel onto the uh, heart or they break off as little uh, bunches and then go and pop onto the surface of the heart and spread over the heart to form the epicardium. And here you can see this for real, not in a cartoon. This is what these little uh, things look like from the proepicardial organ right here on the venous inflow and they break off and go uh, and line the heart. So we have then, this, this happens after the heart tube is formed. This is sort of mid-looping uh, when this happens, when it begins, and then it, it continues after that. And so the epicardium forms a layer outside the myocardium, and then uh, <clears throat> something like cardiac jelly, some little space forms underneath this uh, epicardial layer out here, and then cells from the epicardial layer begin to undergo what's called endothelial or epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. They drop out of the epithelial layer, move down into the space, and become mesenchymal cells, which can then make various things. They make fibroblasts in the myocardium that uh, are virtually all the fibroblasts come from this, and they also make the coronary arteries. This is where coronary endothelial cells and, myocardial, and smooth muscle cells come from. Uh, and, and they grow into the myocardium uh, and from, from this area. So <clears throat> we know now, and this just came out from um, Cliff Tabin's lab at, at Harvard just uh, two or three months ago, uh, it was thought for a while that the proepicardial organ was a fairly homogeneous group of cells, but now it's quite clear that there are at least uh, four populations of cells here uh, that express different uh, uh, markers that you can follow, TBX18, a somophorin, scleraxis, which is uh, involved in tendon and joint and bone formation, but it's also involved in AV valve formation, and some of these cells seem to be involved in AV valve formation and Wilms tumor factor. And we know now that uh, for a while, uh, nobody could find where uh, mammalian endothelial cells come from, because if you trace, do lineage tracing on TBX18 and Wilms tumor ones, they don't make endothelial cells. So, in chicks, it was clear that the endothelial cells came from here, but in, in, in mammals, it wasn't. And now, uh, from Tabin's lab, they've shown that there are two other uh, populations of cells within the proepicardial organ, and that's where the endothelial cells come from. And this just came out about three months ago. Uh, so depending on what kind of stimulation uh, the epicardium gets, it, you know, if it's um, hypoxia-inducible factor, which is what seems to begin the coronary artery formation through the vascular endothelial growth factor and fibroblast uh, growth factor. Uh, it induces uh, formation of endothelial cells, and then uh, other things, PDGF and TGF-beta signaling, induce uh, formation of uh, smooth muscle cells here, and then fibroblasts and other things have, have other pathways. But that's where uh, the cells that make the coronary arteries come from. Now, about a little over a year ago, somebody from Dr. Silverman's former home, uh, Christy Redhorse at um, uh, Stanford, uh, showed that in fact the coronary arteries, at least the surface coronary arteries, don't develop in situ as everybody thought they did. They don't just develop all over the place. In fact, they come out of the sinus venosus, and they sprout out of the sinus venosus and then grow over the dorsal surface of the heart and then come around the outflow tract and around the AV canal and then over the ventral surface of the heart to completely cover it. And it's a progressive thing. It starts at the AV junction and grows around over the ventricles. And these things really do seem to come out of the sinus venosus. Here, I hope you can see this. This is a, a blow up of it. This is the sinus venosus here. And here, the endothelial cells of coronary endothelial cells here are, are stained green, 
and you can see that there's a sprout coming out right there, and there are several of them. You can see them here. Uh, and the cells seem to, the, the coronaries, the main coronary arteries on the surface of the heart seem to grow out of here as a big plexus. And then some kind of signaling that nobody understands causes them to coalesce and form into the pattern that we usually see of the coronary arteries. But initially, in the embryo, there's really a huge plexus, capillary plexus, over the whole uh, heart that then remodels into the main coronaries that we see. And these things grow out of, it looks like, the sinus venosus. And she did a very elegant little experiment here, a very interesting experiment. You can take mouse embryonic hearts and grow them in tissue culture for about 48 hours, not much more than that. But if you time it right, you can grow them when coronary vessels are starting to develop, after the epicardium has actually formed on the surface of the heart and before the coronary arteries have started to develop. And so here is a transgenic, this is a heart from a transgenic animal uh, who's been made to express a dye, if you will, in the coronary endothelial cells, all right? So here you see the blue down here are the endothelial cells of developing coronaries over the ventricle. This is the sinus venosus and atria up here. This is the ventricles down here. Now, if you separate this, if you take, it, take the heart apart here, it doesn't matter because there's no coronary circulation. It doesn't, and the heart's in a tissue culture, so it, it, it will work. And you have the ventricles down here and the sinus venosus and atrium here, you don't get any coronary vessels formed. And then if you put it back together in a little bit different way, so that if you take atria and sinus venosus from a transgenic animal whose coronary endothelial cells express the dye, and you put it on top of a wild-type ventricle whose coronary endothelial cells don't do anything except grow, but they, don't, they aren't colored, you get colored coronary vessels because they all grew out of the sinus venosus and down over the ventricle. This, they couldn't come from here because this ventricle doesn't make colored endothelial cells. It's, it's not transgenic, it's wild type. And if you do the opposite, if you take a wild type sinus venosus and atria and put it back on top of uh, a transgenic ventricles, you get coronaries, but they're not colored. So what this shows is that the cells that are making the endothelial cells from the coronaries must come from the atria or sinus venosus. And it looks like that these, the cells that uh, come from the proepicardial organ, grow in through the coronary sin through the, the, the sinus venosus, uh, and then down onto the ventricles from there. So that this seems to be the pathway in which they get in. Uh, and in fact, the other thing that uh, uh, Christy Redhorse showed was that uh, <clears throat> venous endothelial cells and arterial endothelial cells express different marker proteins on their surface. They look different. You can tell them apart. Uh, and these are venous because they're coming out of the sinus venosus. But as soon as they start to become arterial, as soon as they start to develop into coronary arteries down here, they lose the venous phenotype, become neutral, and then begin to express the arterial phenotype. So these are very plastic. They can change depending on what their role is. And probably also uh, down in the, as they're developing into this plexus, they change roles from, from arterial to venous and venous to arterial depending on what, uh, what they need to do. So the, this kind of plasticity wasn't understood before either, that, uh, that uh, vessels could actually change, the endothelial cells could actually change their character, which I think is a very interesting and exciting thing. And then this plexus forms around the great arteries, and then the coronary arteries penetrate the wall of the aorta here, causing apoptosis as they go through the wall uh, and develop lumen-to-lumen -lumen, uh, contact. And <clears throat> this is another study. This was done a long time ago. This was a quail chick chimera, so that the quail proepicardial organ was put into a chick. Uh, and so you can then track the quail endothelial cells and, and, and stain them differently from chick cells. And here you see this plexus forming around the great arteries here. There are all kinds of little vessels up here around the great arteries. And here you see one making contact with the aorta here. Here's a couple more. There are two or three. Often there, there are several. Uh, and they aren't just confined, and early on, the red over here is smooth muscle cells. So early on, there's no smooth muscle around these. They're just endothelial cells. Um, and they often make contact with the non-coronary sinus, with the two facing. Here's the, 
uh, developing semilunar valves. So this, these are the facing sinuses over here. Here's the PA. And this is the non-facing sinus out here. So you can see they often make contact even with the non-coronary sinus or the non-facing sinus. Uh, but it's somehow only the ones that are adjacent to the pulmonary trunk, that the, the facing sinuses, that get an investment of smooth muscle. And that seems to be what stabilizes the vessel and keeps them uh, and allows the ones that connected to the non-coronary sinus to go away. In this particular experiment, they never saw any connecting with the pulmonary artery. What the directing factors are, what makes coronaries go to one vessel versus the other, nobody knows at this point. Maybe it's one of these somophorins uh, that we've been talking about. Maybe there's some other factors that are expressed in the area under the coronary arteries that, just like axons get directed, that direct coronary arteries to where they're supposed to go. But this, the idea that the coronaries actually grow out of the sinus venosus and that it's clear now that the endothelial cells for coronaries do come from the proepicardial organ, even in mammals, uh, is new information and, and, and exciting and interesting to, to begin to understand better where and how the coronaries uh, get developed. And that leads us to when the coronaries don't connect with the right artery. Again, we don't understand why this happens, uh, but sometimes that's what happens. Uh, and in utero, it doesn't make any difference because, as Dr. Rudolph has told you, the pressure's about the same. Uh, the saturation's not very different in the two great arteries. But once uh, babies are born, that all changes. The pressure falls very quickly, and you begin to develop a retrograde flow through an anomalously connecting coronary artery to the pulmonary trunk. So you get a steal from the myocardium, chronic ischemia, and minimal left to right shunning. Usually that's not an issue. It's really the steal from the left ventricular myocardium through collaterals that develop across the front of the heart, around the apex, through the uh, interventricular septum from septal perforators, and around the back of the heart. And this is what one of these looks like. Here's, we're looking on the outside of the pulmonary trunk here, and there's the left main coronary coming out of the pulmonary trunk. And that's the anterior, or the, or the circumflex there, marginal branch, and then there's a big ramus uh, intermedius there, large uh, first diagonal, and then the anterior descending. And here you see the ostium of the coronary right there in the pulmonary trunk, uh, in this uh, posterior lateral sinus over here in the pulmonary trunk. The aorta is this vessel over here. Now, <clears throat> if we look inside the left ventricle, look at the uh, endocardial fibrosis here. There's very thick endocardium. You can see right there, this is a very dilated ventricle that doesn't function well. Here you see how thick this is, and you can see fibrosis marbling uh, the myocardium as well. And here you see thin papillary muscles because the apices of the papillary muscles become ischemic. The right ventricle looks pretty good, uh, most of it, because it uh, is being perfused uh, relatively well. Uh, it doesn't get very thick, and it doesn't get particularly dilated. Now, here's uh, an example where not all the left coronary, only part of the left coronary comes from the, the um, pulmonary trunk. Here we see the pulmonary trunk, and there's the ostium of the coronary right there that comes from it. And here's that anterior descending. So this is just the anterior descending here coming from the pulmonary trunk. The circumflex is back there coming from the aorta. Here we can track it down. Uh, to the uh, apex. And here's the circumflex back here coming from the aorta. So there are variations on this, the anterior descending here, circumflex here. So it's important to be aware uh, that these kinds of things can happen. Nonetheless, you still get uh, a ven ventricular dysfunction into myocardial fibrosis and uh, uh, abnormal function. And we can have anomalies where the coronaries arise abnormally from the aorta. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. But the, the problem is particularly when they arise from the opposite sinus of Valsalva and pass uh, in between uh, the great arteries uh, as they track, particularly the left as it tracks over uh, to its uh, course. You can get compression between the great arteries. Or as the great arteries expand with exercise, you can get compression with this little tongue of tissue uh, being pushed against the back wall of the coronary artery, causing ischemia during exercise. And here's what this really looks like in person. Uh, here's the slanting orifice of the coronary artery with the little tongue of tissue over it. And you can see that these coronaries are intramural. 
They run within the wall of the aorta, uh, and the coronary artery shares a media with the aorta. There's no adventitia uh, on the outside of the proximal part of the coronary artery here. So it's really right within the wall of the aorta, and then eventually exits the adventitia right here. Here's the left main and circumflex uh, coronary, but you see there's a long intramural segment very often. Here it's crossing the commissure. It should come out of this sinus of Valsalva. Here's the usually intercoronary commissure, and it comes out of the right coronary sinus of Valsalva. So this, is, this course of the coronary seems also to be important uh, in developing ischemia. So here's an example of a not that type, but a little different type of left coronary artery from the right coronary sinus. Here's the aorta here, here's the pulmonary trunk, and here's our right main coronary artery there. There's aorta, pulmonary trunk, and the right main coronary. And there's the left coming off of it. And there's the main right coronary going down this way. These are preventricular branches. And this is the sinus node artery here. And then we'll follow the left coronary around the posterior aspect of the aorta. This is a retroaortic course. This is usually more benign. Uh, and here we're on the left side, there's the circumflex and the anterior descending coronary artery. So this is a one type of single coronary where the right coronary comes from the, or sorry, the left comes from the right sinus, but here it goes around behind the aorta, it doesn't go in between, uh, and there you can see this big orifice in the, uh, or just a little above it actually, um, that gives rise to both of these coronary arteries. Then <clears throat> this is a little bit different type, this is one that does pass in between, that's the uh, non-coronary sinus there, you can see it in continuity with the mitral valve, this is the left coronary sinus, and this should be the right coronary sinus, but in fact, the right coronary arises up there, fairly high up above the commissure and a little bit above the left coronary sinus. This is the left coronary ostium there. So you can see both of them there above the same sinus. That one, um, <clears throat> again, with the oblique uh, orifice of the coronary, uh, and there you can see the left coronary artery there. So this is what right from the left coronary sinus looks like. And we'll turn it around and look at it on the outside here shortly. This high origin is frequent uh, when coronaries arise from the opposite sinus of Valsalva. <clears throat> and here we, we're, we're looking at it on the other side, and here's the right coronary right there. And you see how it passes between the pulmonary artery here and the aorta back there uh, to reach the, 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 the right uh, AV groove. And here's a, another example of a single coronary ostium. Here's the pulmonary trunk and the aorta here. And uh, this is uh, the right coronary here, but it's quite high up. Uh, it takes off up pretty high, and there's the right coronary coming this way. Uh, preventricular branch, the right coronary artery going this way. And in between, you can see that there's another coronary running quite high up here. Uh, coming across in between the great arteries uh, from an orifice inside, uh, high up in the, above the sinus of Valsalva. And there's that uh, coronary coming down on the, on the left side. So these are a couple of examples. This is a coronary osteostenosis. You can see it's sort of a C-shaped, slit-like coronary oh. ostium here, uh, that this baby died suddenly. Perhaps this was uh, part of the reason for it. Uh, this uh, coronary osteostenosis that you see right there. And finally, a myocardial bridge, just as an example. It's hard to know how important this is, but uh, to show you what it looks like, there's the circumflex and the anterior descending uh, in this patient. And here you see uh, a diagonal branch here. And look how the coronary dives into the myocardium here. This is all myocardium on top of the coronary here. It's been uh, taken away, cut away so you can see it and then the coronary returns back to the surface of the heart uh, down here. So you have this big segment of anterior descending coronary that runs beneath uh, about a five or six millimeters of myocardium here and then continues down uh, the AV groove over here. So those are 
Well, we'll skip this stuff. Uh, those are some examples of uh, coronary artery abnormalities uh, that we see, and also some uh, new information or relatively new information about how coronary arteries form. I'm just kidding. Oh, I can duck behind the podium here if you want to throw something at me. So we're going to talk about uh, congenital anomalies of the coronaries, uh, the big ones, and then a couple of little ones. Uh, and uh, I'll put the timer on so that I don't go over time. All right. Well, I might go over time, but what the hell. Um, all right, so uh, we'll talk about uh, congenital coronary anomalies, uh, anomalous origin of the left coronary from the pulmonary artery, how you diagnose that by echo, anomalous origin of the right coronary artery from the pulmonary artery, which is rarer, and anomalous origin of the coronary artery from, the, uh, from branch pulmonary arteries, the uh, anomalous origin of the coronary artery from the right sinus, the left coronary from the right sinus, and the right coronary from the left sinus, the origins in congenital heart disease and tetralogy and transposition, and by that stage you'll all be dead. So here we go. So uh, looking at normal coronary arteries, best to look at them in the short axis, um, I've shown you some normal coronary, so that's not really something I'm going to spend any time on. But I'm just going to tell you that you need to add on color flow information in order to evaluate the directionality of the flow in the coronary arteries. And you can see, as you know, red and yellow flow comes towards and blue turquoise flow goes away. Uh, so this over here is a coronary vein which is running past the heart and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to leave that and um, let's look at this big disease, the bland white garland syndrome. I call it polka, like a dance, pulmonary origin of the left coronary artery. Other people call it alcapa, which is not like a South American in, uh, animal called an alpaca. <laughs> Completely different. Okay. So um, they have... Uh, if you're smart enough, you can get them before the diagnosis of the cardiomyopathic appearance of the left ventricle. They almost always have mitral regurgitation accompanied by papillary muscle fibrosis. They have a larger right than left coronary artery. Coronary flow imaged uh, throughout the myocardium through the collateral vessels that develop or fistula. There's retrograde flow in the coronary circulation. A jet of flow can always be seen entering the pulmonary artery. shouldn't say always, but most of the time. And direct imaging of the coronary artery entering the pulmonary artery completes the picture. So let's go from general to specific. And you can see how that part of the myocardium that I've arrowed at the top here is not working very well. In fact, a lot of the myocardium is not working very well. I'm sure Mark would find abnormal strain patterns all over in these ventricles. Okay. I'm sure you will. <laughs> and, uh, and in addition, um, this fibrosis of the endocardium and particularly of the origins of the papillary muscles is very important. The papillary muscles are um, uh, vascularized of quite late and they frequently become fibrosed and that contributes to the uh, mitral insufficiency together with the dilation of the left ventricle. And I think you can see the incoordinate contraction of that left ventricle. You see what I call the halo sign as the blood 
is very slowly swirling around in this left ventricle and you don't need Doppler uh, to actually calculate the velocity of flow uh, within the vessels. And here I call this the halo sign and you can see how long uh, systole is here. It's almost the entire cardiac cycle and then the blood is flowing in here along the margins of the heart and out the left ventricular outflow tract and there's a donut of no flow which is uh, this is why these cells are accumulating in this region uh, representing really pretty uh, bad function and here's another look at the uh, the mitral regurgitation uh, which is a wall hugging jet here with the following the candor effect uh, and is pretty substantial uh, mitral insufficiency so what happens in this condition is the development of collateral flow. Uh, I should just go back. This is um, a patient at the time of surgery for an anomalous coronary. And I, I don't know whether you can appreciate the huge dilatation of collateral vessels on the surface of the myocardium here. Okay, so if you can see it at surgery, you probably can see it by echo too. So if we look here, you can see uh, the flow in the vessels all over the heart. And generally, if you can pick up the left anterior descending, you can see here that the flow is going in the wrong direction. It should be coming out of the ventricle and going down there, and it isn't. And you can see this rich vascularization of the myocardium in the most unusual places, and even with a high Nyquist limit, uh, this is indeed evident. Here's the left anterior descending coronary artery coming off the aorta from an apical five-chamber view. And you can see the LAD directionality of flow is completely in the wrong direction. And of course, you can see this myocardial uh, vascularization all over in this condition. Now, I have a very nice, uh, I think this is a Cine CT of an anomalous coronary artery, uh, which I pulled from the literature. Here is the aorta. The heart has been rotated a little bit round. Here is the pulmonary artery, and here is this, um, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, tor that's it. Thank you very much. Tortuous uh, coronary artery from all of these collaterals, and here you can see the flow going back in the other direction. But more importantly, if you look over here in this, uh, obviously a small neonate, you can see, firstly, that there's pericardial fluid which is moving. And as the pericardial fluid moves, you think you may be looking at a coronary, but you're not. You're really looking at pericardial fluid with color. But over here, you follow the coronary artery, and here's the LAD, and it's traveling blue backwards. And here's the circumflex, and it's traveling red forwards, which is exactly the wrong way for the coronary to flow. Okay, and now we can look a little bit more closely, and here you can see um, uh, in, in an anomalous coronary the aorta, where the cor left coronary should arise from, and the uh, LAD here with the wrong flow, and you notice that there's also a degree of, uh, of retrograde flow as the myocardium is still squeezing blood backwards. If we look up here, we can see the uh, flow from the left coronary coming into the, uh, from here, coming into the pulmonary artery and jetting into the pulmonary artery. And here is the anomalous coronary artery running over here. I'd like to point out something else to you, because until color flow came along, lots of people missed this diagnosis by echo. And they missed it because echocardiography is not perfect. Yeah, Dr. Sanders has missed it too. And so is Dr. Silverman, and so did Dr. Fisher. And it's published in the literature if you want to read those cases. But here is one of the reasons why it got missed, and I'll explain it to you what happened here. Here's the coronary. It's going into the pulmonary artery. But if you had a little dropout over here, then maybe you would think that it was coming in this direction. And here's the aorta, and this area here is the transverse pericardial sinus. Now, all you need is two perfect dropouts there, and the coronary artery arises from the aorta. So this is how we made this mistake. And we made it fairly often. I think things changed with Doppler color flow. In addition here, I think when you use Doppler color flow, in addition to seeing this abnormal flow, and I think a very clear area, you can also see a little bit of a jet here. 
And that's the other thing about anomalous coronary arteries. It's not usually a torrential flow into the left coronary artery. So you've got to be very careful that you look for it. And even when you look at it angiographically, uh, it may be somewhat difficult to see. So as I said, if you didn't like that picture, I have a few others for you. And there is a beautiful example of the anterior descending and circumflex draining into the left main coronary artery and from thence into the pulmonary artery. And you can do that with color flow to uh, show that this patient has got a little bit more flow coming uh, of, uh, up here and into the pulmonary artery. You can see uh, very nicely the, the anomalous flow going into the back of the pulmonary artery. We can look at this from a variety of views. I've turned the specimen over here. I actually did this angiogram myself on a patient with anomalous coronary artery. If Dr. Rudolph, for historical purposes, this is 16 millimeter angiography that I think we abandoned in 1980. Um, so it's uh, before 1980. And this was a pulmonary artery injection with a Berman catheter placed in here. And you can see the origin of the left coronary artery arising of the pulmonary artery angiographically. But more importantly, you can look at the echocardiogram that way. And here you can see uh, the origin of the left pulmonary artery coming from the back forwards and into the pulmonary artery. And these just are uh, more of the same. So uh, we actually at one stage described contrast echocardiography in the right in the aorta to show the vessels rising in there. Now this is a very, very important picture because um, I think that... Uh, one's concept of anomalous origin of the left coronary artery needs to be broadened. Um, here is a pathological specimen which shows the left coronary artery. Okay, the aorta is over here. This is the pulmonary artery. And here this left coronary artery is arising peripherally as in E here from the left pulmonary artery trunk. And they may also rise at the origin of the right pulmonary artery to the right pulmonary to the pulmonary trunk. And of course, they can arise all the way around here. Now, that creates somewhat of a problem because if you ever get a patient like this, and you know, we, if we're going to see in this room 100 anomalous coronaries in our lifetime, it's going to be a lot. But it's an important diagnosis to make. So there's varieties of surgical options that are open to fix this. The classical one is the button technique where you take a button just as in an arterial switch and move it around. Uh, you can also take a ring of tissue like this, excise the whole ring of tissue, open it up, split it, and make a long loop of tissue. You can then anastomose. But these right coronary anomalies run over here in intramural course. And if the surgeon doesn't recognize this, they can take the coronary artery off and do all kinds of wrong things. These operations are best repaired by opening the aorta and marsupializing the inside of the coronary so that the coronary artery is directly anastomosed to the wall, as you see here. And then the distal coronary artery is just ligated over there. And now the left coronary artery arises from the aorta. Well, what about post-surgical? Well, the most amazing thing post-surgically is, uh, physiologically, I think one has to think of anomalous left coronary arteries as if they were fistulas. And so there's a big right coronary because it's doing the feeding, and the left coronary artery is small. And uh, immediately after surgery, the is a reversal of the size of the coronary arteries, one to the other. And here you can now see prograde flow in the coronary artery. Here you can see the prograde flow. Here's the button anastomosed here and here. And here is another example of the button without color. You can see the surgical sutures of the button as it's been sutured uh, into the aortic root. Okay. Now, we know, um, and Mark will probably talk about this, that um, anomalous coronary arteries, uh, the, the, coronary, the myocardial performance improves. And we know that that happens, and we can help it because we have to sometimes take care of the mitral, associated mitral insufficiency in these patients. And there's a degree of improvement. Here's a one-year post-myocardial uh, uh, infarction, uh, uh, um, anomalous coronary myocardial infarction ventricle, and I think it looks better. The patient also had a mitral annulaplasty. 
there's still a degree of uh, fibrosis noted in the posterior endocardium, but I think that that's quite reasonable function. And of course, then again, it depends which tests you apply to see whether the function is abnormal. Now, my former boss at the Cardiovascular Research Institute, Julius Comro, used to say a normal person is simply one who hasn't had enough tests. So when Mark gets up and he tells you, he'll show that there certainly are uh, abnormalities that remain uh, in this condition. Now, anomalous right coronary artery is rarer and less important, but just let me show you an embarrassment here. Here's a patient who came for ASD repair at a different institution from my own and um, got the ASD repair but never got an echo. And uh, this is the um, left coronary artery injection here. And you can see the anomalous right coronary entering the pulmonary artery. Here's the left coronary injection. Here is the anastomosis. And there is the flow going off into the pulmonary artery through the right coronary. Okay. Uh, here's uh, the uh, pulmonary artery opened with the coronary artery running into it. Here's pulmonary insufficiency. Here's a little flow going round. And here's the pulmonary valve. And there's the anomalous flow going into the uh, coronary artery there. So because the demands and the flow in the left are greater than the right, the rights don't present uh, acutely like the lefts, but they can uh, create all kinds of problems. And here you see the collateral vessel coming back and then the flow uh, coming into the a pulmonary artery from this uh, uh, area just adjacent to the cusp. So let me just uh, take this one off over here and just show you a little uh, uh, issue here. This is very important because we know that uh, this uh, anomalous origin of the right coronary from the left sinus, left coronary from the right sinus, beg your pardon, uh, here uh, in terms of life expectancy is remarkably decreased. The one from the right from the left coronary artery has a variable approach. This is courtesy of Dr. Tom Call, uh, who analyzed the AFIP uh, Institute data from America. And you will recognize what? They're all dead. They're all dead, yes. But their age at death. Okay, well, I'm not making any conclusion about it, but there is an incidence of demise in anomalous coronary right from the left sinus. Yeah. Yes, probably true. It's a lethal, in fact. Right. Um, but uh, you recognize uh, Steve Sanders' drawings over here, and something that I obtained that I think is very important about the intramural course of these vessels. When the vessel runs an intramural course, uh, it changes its caliber, okay? And so whereas a cir circle is quite difficult to compress, once the vessel has this kind of caliber, you can imagine that stresses and strains on either side of this vessel can critically uh, 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 lower the lumen size. And um, so here I can show you just with a anomalous, uh, 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 an intramural course. They, I, I think that uh, most of them have an intramural course. Here is the coronary artery running between the aorta and the pulmonary artery in transposition. So here's an intramural course of the vessel. And here is, again, another intramural coronary artery in transposition. As you see it over there, the right coronary is just fine. Now, um, this is a conclusion I can make from an autopsy because this was one of my patients. Uh, this is from also from the 1980s. And this was a child that came to me with fainting. And uh, I think that's one of the things one learns about experiences that when somebody faints, there are very occasionally anomalous coronary arteries in the future or in the past. And this is a patient with, there's the right coronary from the right sinus. Here's the left coronary from the left sinus. And the uh, pathologist has unfortunately unroofed the structure as it's running in here. This patient had an anomalous origin of the, uh, the left coronary from the right sinus. Here's the right sinus. And here's the slit-like origin of this vessel. And here is the echocardiographic appearance of the structure. You notice that this runs an intramural course. 
and it also crosses the commissure just as its cousin does in uh, aorta palmary transposition. So if you didn't like that picture, here's one with color flow, and you can see uh, color flow in this particular instance. There doesn't seem to be any acceleration related to this uh, coronary artery here. Uh, unfortunately, this patient had a somewhat different outcome. This is a, as you can see from the size of this patient, was a six foot, 18 year old uh, who um, had spent his life fainting every summer and being resuscitated without anybody bothering until he got to a pediatric cardiologist. Uh, and he had a lot of mitral regurgitation because his left ventricle was uh, pretty bad. And if you look here in the transesophageal, which is the first time I got to see him, he had an anomalous coronary artery with an intramural course. And I think as you follow this intramural course, you will see how this vessel narrows its caliber in the anteroposterior diameter and as it runs through the myocardium. And then when it runs out of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, root and they're on the surface, it increases its caliber quite remarkably. And unfortunately, uh, the annuloplasty didn't work on this patient. Here's a, a cast of such a structure coming through the, the, the root there. And he actually landed up getting a heart transplant. Now, anomalous right coronary arteries are the ones that I used uh, Dr. Carl's dead curve to make an extrapolation. Seems to have a better prognosis. Uh, but it, as, again, if you look at the AFIP uh, data, there clearly are patients that have had anomalous uh, coronary artery that have died. And this was a young 12-year-old active boy who was a swimmer, and every time he hit the water, he fainted. And he had an intramural uh, right coronary arising from the left sinus, an actually mirror image of the previous example. And here's a magnified view taken at the time of his uh, uh, unroofing. Um, and, and he did very well after his surgery. So uh, the, the, the point is that um, there are patients that are symptomatic and anomalous coronary arteries, the first event that you might find is actually sudden death. Uh, so you'll be lucky enough if you see this uh, that you have to really seriously consider what treatment uh, you want to apply uh, for these patients. Um, the one nice thing about intramural coronaries is they share an association with transposition in that the coronary arteries are usually high when they run an intramural course, which is a, an interesting pointer for us to find as echocardiographers, but is more important because the surgeon can simply snip up the coronary and unroof it at the time of surgery. If the coronary artery, like the usual coronary arteries, is running within the sinus of Valsalva, the surgeon can't do that. He either has to detach the whole sinus of Valsalva and unroof the coronary, or he has to marsupialize it in the same way as I showed you that anomalous uh, coronary artery um, uh, over there. So anyway, uh, that's uh, the, the appearance. Now, uh, in transposition, here's a, a patient with transposition with a normal right coronary artery, a normal left coronary artery, and I'll let these play quickly for you so that you can see that. And we look at these uh, from a number of points of view. It's usually easy to see them parasternally, but if you can't see them from the parasternal view, you can go and look at them from other views. And here are the, uh, the, the, the studies done by Dr. Sanders uh, showing the percentage of coronary arteries published by Luciana Pasquini, uh, with, who worked with Dr. Sanders, and showing what coronary arteries look like in transposition, the common or usual form, the one where the, uh, the, um, the whole uh, circumflex comes off the right coronary artery with a separate left anterior descending, the so-called solitary right or single right coronary artery where the uh, circumflex and the left anterior descending rise, a single left coronary artery where the uh, right coronary arises from the left and scoots round, and the so-called double loop pattern. Now, I like to work from simple grounds, and if I can see here, as I have from McAlpin's book, a circumflex in a normal patient running around the back of the aortic root, here in transposition, if you find a vessel running around the back of the 
the back vessel, which is the pulmonary route, you have to think of one of, uh, of three options. It's either single, uh, a, a circumflex off the right, which is the most common, a single right, or a double loop pattern. So if you don't find a coronary running off here, it's either a normal situation or a single left coronary artery. And these are the percentages that you're likely to find in uh, this, this condition. So just let's look at a circumflex as it runs behind the pulmonary artery here and on the back surface of the heart. You didn't like that picture? I have a few others I can show you. Here, the vessels usually lie in a more side-by-side uh, association, so as you get sometimes with double outlet right ventricle where there's a VSD. Oh, that means I've got a minute left. So uh, here's the left circumflex running uh, off the back. Sometimes they come uh, from a single orifice. Sometimes they're two separate orifices within the coronary arteries. Uh, here's a single right coronary oh. artery. The right coronary artery is running over here. Here comes this branch. It runs around the back of the heart here. And here's the left anterior descending. And here runs the rest of the circumflex. And if we go look in the subcostal view, in another patient with such a condition, you can see the right coronary artery, the left coronary artery. And when I take the labels off, we can look at the origins. And it seems that they're two separate orifices from the same cusp arising off the back of this artery. So you can see all of those things. And uh, here I've got the Malcalpin uh, picture once again. And here runs the left coronary artery behind the pulmonary artery and the V-shaped structure and the left anterior descending running all the way through these sections here. So it's easy to see this coronary. It's a simple thing to find. When you see that, you're either dealing with options two, three, or five in the Pasquini diagram, which I have uh, hanging up in my laboratory so I can remember what they are. Okay, now you may get a single right coronary, a left coronary artery, and here's a left coronary artery coming off the, the sinus, well, coming from a single orifice, because here's the separate vessel here, both coming from one sinus, and the artery is looping over the anterior surface of the ventricle and running uh, to the right. Uh, this makes it very difficult to actually do uh, the uh, switching of the vessels, and that's why it's important to tell the surgeons. Now, a good surgeon can do almost anything, but uh, it's always nice to go into the operating room being prepared, and it sort of cements uh, the relationship between the surgeon and the cardiologist. Here's a true single left coronary artery arising from one orifice. I'm sorry for the tachycardia. And here's a patient who's actually got corrected transposition. So the vessel's in the wrong direction, and the right ventricle is lying on this side. So here's the single vessel with the coronary going backwards, and here's the coronary over the anterior surface in a pulsatile fashion, indicating it's not simply a pericardial fluid. So the point is to an intramural coronary in this situation is, number one, malalignment between the cusps of the sinuses of Alsalva, high takeoff of the coronary artery, for above the sinotubular ridge, crossing a commissure, side-by-side -side great vessels, and a coronary artery running between the two great vessels. So here's an example of intramural coronaries. I think we've seen that one before, the one on the right side. And here is the example from Dr. Tsifa's work, publishing Cardiology in the Young in March 2002, where she looked at the intramural coronary arteries in a series of patients with transposition, and all of these had, here's the sinotubular junction, only one of them was really within the sinus of Alsalva, and the rest of them were high, and of course, uh, this is the normal, here is a complete intramural course, and here is a partial. Uh, okay, here's the malalignment of the, of the uh, great vessels, of, of the cusps, one to the other, look. Uh, this it doesn't look like a diagram that I know, they're offset here as you can see on the cartoon that I've attempted to make over there. And again, you can see not only is it there, but there's a single uh, vessel running an intramural course, uh, giving rise to the left and the circumflex uh, arteries. And we've seen that, so I'm going to move on. Uh, 
Well, you tell me. Well, when the, when the vessel runs intramural, there's a much higher incidence of malalignment. I don't understand why. Maybe you do, Steve. But... Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the coronary arteries, it's more challenging. But the, 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 when, when, when the arteries are a malaligned one to the other, they often have an intramural course. And you can compare this over here where the, it looks just as we understand when we do cartoons of how the facing sinuses are aligned. And here, in this example, they're clearly malaligned. And I think that's a pointer to an intramural coronary artery. Okay, we have to get through this now. Okay, now in tetralogy, the number one problem is a coronary artery that crosses the right ventricular outflow tract, albeit a big uh, conus branch or the left anterior descending. And here you can see at surgery, you can see this coronary artery which is going to cross the, the right ventricular outflow tract so that if the surgeon were to consider doing an infant dipulectomy over here from the surface, he might cut the coronaries. And I think that becomes very important on second procedures. And often if you watch the surgeons, they will go in and put in a few little stitches so they can see where the coronary runs so that when they come back and there's been a pericardial reaction, they can find out where the coronary arteries run. So that becomes very important if it runs across the outflow tract. And here is such an example of a patient at surgery. Here's the main coronary artery. Here's the left anterior descending, and here's the right. You can see this patient has got a much smaller pulmonary artery than an aorta, and I'll take off the labels. And you can see here the right coronary artery and the LAD arising from this. And I can stop that on the ideal frame. And again, once again, looking at coronary arteries, you really don't have um, a whole lot of time to look at this. I'm praying. Oh, there we go. So here is the left anterior descending. Here's the short main, and here's the right coronary artery coming across there. So, and I mentioned this yesterday, so I'm going to run through it. But we know that uh, what we asked about why uh, truncuses do so poorly is because they have coronary artery anomalies. If you're from Paris, they believe it's 100%. The literature series shows 17 and 18%. Here again is an intramural coronary artery. Here is high course to these coronary arteries. And so we showed that yesterday. Thank you for your attention. There are many more, but I don't have time to show them all. Uh, who's to, uh, uh, Girish? Are you going to talk now? Mark? Dr. Rudolph, it's your turn. Yes, you can take three minutes. We can take five. I'm very generous. <laughs> Do you want your, your pictures? No. Oh, I've got them up here if you want them. No, it's just okay. to give me the both of them. Oh, can I stay with you? Okay. I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about our kappa, anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery. And the, the, the point I want to bring out to you is that, like with Kawasaki disease, we make the diagnosis after most of the damage has been done. And it's unfortunate that we really don't have any way of making this diagnosis before the heart has been severely affected. Now, one of the, the things that's interesting about this condition is that it's, it's, we understand why there's no problem during fetal life, that the pulmonary artery pressure is high, and therefore there's no problem with perfusing the myocardium. The blood that perfuses the myocardium, we mentioned repeatedly that pulmonary arterial oxygen saturation is about 50%. <coughs> 
as compared to what you would expect from the uh, ASEAN aorta of 65%. But that amount of reduction in oxygen saturation is not important because the coronary vessels dilate readily in response to hypoxemia. So that it's perfectly understandable that during fetal life, there's no problem with oxygen delivery. Now, the concept has always been presented that the, after birth, that the baby doesn't get into trouble until pulmonary vascular resistance fall, falls and pulmonary arterial pressure falls. Well, in fact, that doesn't make sense because most of these babies don't get into trouble before two to three months after birth. Now, if you think about what happens in a normal infant with pulmonary circulation, pulmonary vascular resistance, as I've shown you before, drops dramatically within the first couple of days. And within a week, it's really down to close to adult levels. So how do we explain what's going on then? Because in fact, uh, by the time, within a week after birth, pulmonary arterial systolic pressure is lower than aortic diastolic pressure. So there's no way in which it can be perfusing the coronary circulation. So what's happening then? Well, the first possibility is that in fact, there is already a problem with myocardial perfusion and we're not recognizing that it's having a slow effect on causing problems with the myocardium. But I think we have to consider what is it that affects oxygen supply to the myocardium. And I think that the reason, to my view, is that the reason that this is delayed for some weeks or a couple of months before the baby manifests problems is, again, I keep on harping on this, but I think it's important that hemoglobin concentration falls from 16 grams per deciliter to 10 grams per deciliter within two months. And I think that that is a very important factor in influencing oxygen supply to the myocardium because if you have a drop of 30-40% of oxygen delivery, that's a very substantial amount. But I, I still think that this doesn't explain the whole mechanism of what's going on, why the damage occurs and when it occurs. And I think there are a number of factors to, to take into consideration. Dr. Sanders showed this dramatic development of collateral circulation. Now, what happens with collateral circulation without, without kappa? Well, we know that when a coronary artery is occluded in an adult, then develops collateral circulation around it to attempt to supply the myocardium. Now, in the, in the uh, newborn infant who has an L kappa, there's no, we don't understand why a collateral circulation develops. It, you know, if you think about it, there is an arterial supply, but why should they develop collaterals? Now, you can say it's because they have myocardial hypoxemia, but we don't know what it is that causes collateral circulation to develop. And of course, we do know that once collateral circulation does develop in these babies, with the connections to the abnormally draining, uh, abnormally draining pulmonary artery, uh, the pulmonary artery, that you do get an, e an enormous steal. And this possibly is another factor that determines why the, there's a delay in the onset of myocardial problems. But I think we have to recognize that there's a lot we don't understand about this condition. And we should not think, accept the, the proposal that it's a drop in pulmonary vascular resistance that, in, that produces these problems, because that occurs much earlier. Thanks.
stop when the 10 minutes is up. So here's a uh, 3D uh, echo of a, of a child that underwent um, Alcapa repair and didn't recover function and remained with a uh, um, dilated cardiomyopathy. And you see these are volume curves. And the normal should be reducing volume in systole. And you see that some curves, some segments, are increasing their volume in systole, as you see. Uh, over here, and uh, I'll get to that in the strain curves as well. And I showed you this on the first day, and I want to repeat this because it pertains to what I'm going to show you on ischemia imaging. This is the same infant, and this is tissue Doppler, and you can see the scarring of the papri muscle and the globular, abnormally shaped, dilated left ventricle, and you can see very low tissue velocities in systole, which is marked by aortic valve opening and closure. And you have this very abnormal peak systolic motion, which is way higher than any other velocity during the cardiac cycle that happens after aortic valve closure. And this is certainly not specific to ischemia, but has been most published uh, in ischemia. And so you should look for ischemia or causes of ischemia when you see it. It relates to an imbalance between various myocardial segments that develop uh, force and strain at, the, at different times. Uh, here are the strain curves of this same infant, and just like the volume curves, what's interesting is you can see that this light blue and the yellow, which are the basal septal uh, segments over here, start to develop uh, deformation uh, in early systole. Uh, you can see that their deformation is very abnormal, but as they deform, what they do is they stretch the dead segments uh, of the lateral wall around the scarred tissue here. So even if you um, uh, re restore uh, blood uh, supply and perfusion to this myocardium, it's essentially dead myocardium, uh, as uh, Dr. Rudolph was saying. Now, most infants, though, don't remain with such severe uh, um, dysfunction, and most recover their, uh, their uh, function uh, at least to a good degree, as Norman showed. Um, Dr. Rudolph asked me about another condition, if we have serial data to show the myocardial deformation over time. I wish we did for this condition. This is the only real data I know from Luke Mertens, and this is a single infant. So it's not a series of infants. It's a single infant over time. And what Luke showed after repair is that you do have normalization of longitudinal and radial strain up to about 10 months where it almost reaches uh, normal values. There is a difference in the time velocity between the longitudinal and radial strain that's less important now to go into. So most infants, when they recover function, have recovery of strain, but we don't have very good data to show that. In adults that have acute myocardial infarction, you see a dramatic reduction of strain and of strain rate. And you can see here this development of strain rate after the aortic valve has closed. That's the same what I showed you by motion with tissue velocities. That's post-systolic contraction uh, using a strain rate. So that the peak strain here, uh, it peaks after the aortic valve has closed. And it's the same phenomenon uh, in this uh, ischemic myocardium, whereas the remote region from the ischemia, the non-ischemic myocardium, develops peak strain as normal with aortic valve closure. So those phenomena are useful in, in at least in adult literature, because this is where all the experience is. Um, if you then restore uh, perfusion after an acute myocardial ischemia, and you don't have any scar, you'll see normalization uh, of uh, the strain curve. If you have a non-transmural scar, you develop some strain, but it doesn't normalize. And if you have a full thickness scar, uh, you don't develop strain in the dead, uh, in the fibrotic uh, region. Uh, 
Now, uh, Jensui, Voigt, and others have suggested that strain imaging, because of these phenomena, is as sensitive or approaches the sensitivity of nuclear imaging and other techniques to detect ischemia uh, during uh, exercise or during dobutamine st uh, stress echocardiography. I don't have personal experience with this, but I think this literature is interesting for us because we, in pediatrics, we don't look at uh, ischemia a lot. And, uh, and the response is going to be similar to what I showed you before. You can see here an apical and basal segment, and the apical segment has the reduced perfusion by nuclear imaging here, and you can see very abnormal strain. It's being stretched, as I showed you in our, our Kappa patient, uh, early in systole, and then developing post-systolic shortening, whereas the remote segment, the basal segment, which has normal perfusion, just develops normal strain during dobutamine. So there are groups that propose to do this in a routine fashion for detection of ischemic uh, segments. And here from the same work, you can see, again, uh, this is the um, ischemic portion, which doesn't develop strain. Here's peak exercise and then recovery, uh, whereas uh, if you look at post-systolic strain, you get the reverse. The ischemic segment shows that post-systolic strain and the remote segment doesn't have post-systolic strain. Now, this is a complex um, and busy slide from Bart Bainens, but it really summarizes beautifully the changes that occur, and you can see that it's complex. What I want to show, this just shows strain rate, strain, post-systolic strain. Let's stop at those three. This shows dobutamine low and high dose, and the arrows show the response, and here's reduced chronic perfusion, acute reperfusion, and here's reserve. And uh, what you can see is the worst your reduction in coronary artery flow, the worst your strain is going to be, and the higher, or you're going to develop post-systolic shortening when you uh, stimulate that myocardium with dobutamine. Also interesting, what I want you to take from here is stunned myocardium. We've certainly had the occasional child that's had a coronary abnormality. You may fix it or you address it surgically, and then you have myocardium that doesn't respond, and you're not sure if that's dead myocardium, if it's stunned myocardium, and whether you can or whether you can reperfuse that. And strain imaging is useful for that because stunned myocardium during dobutamine, during low-dose dobutamine even, uh, reacts. It, uh, it increases uh, the strain and decreases uh, or doesn't change post-systolic shortening. So that's a useful uh, tool to try and uh, diagnose a stunned myocardium. And I'm not going to go through the rest of the slide, but those are the uh, main things uh, I wanted to show. When you've got full thickness scars, you don't respond with strain. You, you, stay, you stay low at any uh, degree. So it also depends on the degree of perfusion and the degree uh, of scarring. And people have used this to show viability uh, at rest using strain, and it gives some kind of prediction. But you can see that the area under the curves are pretty weak. They close to the, uh, the uniformity line. When you exercise, you can improve that prediction much better because it's a provocative test of perfusion to the uh, myocardium. Uh, and that's, I'm going to skip over this. I wanted to show uh, this. This is a completely different disease uh, in a way. This is a, a rejection uh, after a transplant. But I, the reason I wanted to show this is sometimes it's mixed with coronary artery disease, and I'll show you an example of that. And I wanted to show you this is because this is what we use clinically in our lab for strain imaging. So when we have a functional protocol, if you're wondering how to introduce all these techniques to your lab and they're time consuming, and like everything else that's new, there's a learning curve and it takes time, what we do is we acquire a four, three, and two chamber view from the apex, longitudinal view. So four, three, and two chamber. This, we, we have sonographers, but whoever's doing the study just tr traces the endocardium uh, at the time of the study, uh, and, the, and this package, which is from GE and this, uh, the other packages out there, then creates this bull's eye map. And when I read as a, uh, in, the, in the reading room, if, I don't, you know, if I'm not seeing the patient myself, I can get these curves, and if the curves are reliable, and this is where the difficulties become in interpretation, you can immediately see where there are abnormalities. So that's very quick because we do the 4, 3, and 2 chamber anyway as part of a functional protocol. The tracing takes a few minutes extra, and you've got to determine if the curves are reliable. That's the most important. But we only use this longitudinal strain 
clinically uh, you know, on a routine basis in every functional uh, protocol. And when you do it routinely, like anything else, it becomes quick and, and more reliable. So you've got to decide if that's what you introduce into the lab. But if you decide to introduce anywhere uh, strain into your lab on a routine basis, this is a good place to start because it's easy to do and longitudinal strain is more uh, reproducible. So here's a patient uh, that uh, had uh, rejection and coronary artery disease after transplant. And if you just look at the strain maps, you can immediately see where the abnormal uh, area is. So it gives a very quick uh, visual view and it's not uh, it doesn't take long uh, to acquire. So I think I'm going to stop there uh, and not talk about bicycle echo, which we've now using to replace dobutamine stress echo as part of our transplant uh, protocols. I think, it's re I think it's recovery of function because once you have fibrosis and dead muscle scar, uh, that doesn't, that, that's not going to recover. You may have remodeling of the ventricle in different ways, but I don't think that muscle uh, recovers. Right, so the question, has it infarcted or not? And that will depend on what you spoke about, the collateral formation, the hemoglobin and oxygen delivery, the, the uh, metabolic needs of the muscle over time. It's obvious that it's a different disease from an acute occlusion, but in terms of work, and uh, I, I didn't really compare it, but there's two things. There is animal work of acute occlusion, but there's also clinical work in the adult world of acute myocardial infarction uh, and uh, opening that up with a PCI, as I showed you. Yes, yes, yes. So they're different diseases, I accept that. And you saw from the strain curves that it's, it's over months, not over... But, but I mean enough to, yeah. to get off ECMO. I don't yeah. Mean that yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah.
Just, just two comments. I also think that the ventricular remodeling over time contributes to the continuing improvement in function. So it's not just a matter of the myocardium has improved and now we're done. Uh, over time, that, that also contributes to both mitral regurgitation and to the improved ejection fraction and strain, et cetera.